Welcome to the video as we continue to work our way through Beacon Pines and all of its many endings and branches. One of these ones absolutely had me tears streaming down my face honestly so look out for that one and enjoy this video. I hope you're enjoying it. If you are hit like and subscribe and leave me a comment and let me know because that really really helps. I will see you on the other side. So we've got to come over to this branch. Flight. He squinted down the barrel of the mission control defense cannon, aiming it through an opening in the dense tree branches. He looked up with surprise as it struck true and taut. I can't believe that worked. Hey, Mr. Carr. We'd love to hear our thoughts. But I'm afraid we have places to be. Come on, Eggie. Feel jacked. them. This way. We'll take the tunnels. Luca and Iggy winced as they sprinted through the thicket. Their branches clawed at them, reluctant to give passage. After what felt like a marathon, Luca stopped in his tracks as they reached a clearing. What the? That was all he was able to say before Iggy slammed into his back. The boys tumbled down a steep decline and crashed with a wheezing thud on a surface as hard as ice. In fact, it was ice. Signs. They stood silently, catching their breath. The sky was like sapphire. With each breath, a plume of steam escaped from Luca's lungs. Let's get moving. Luca pulled Diggy to his feet and they gazed across a snowy terrain. Oh look, we're here. Wow, how perfect. That was actually pretty badass. Uh-huh. I think we lost him. Are we up in the mountains? I don't think so. If anything, we went downhill. I'm up at the Wither Wonderland. <laughs> Sorry, just... All I know is there's no going back the way we came. I've recorded this over like the last four days. <laughs> At night time, and I just... If the voice has changed, I'm sorry, that's why. It's been like a day. Let's see if we can get our bearings. Follow me. A disk of smooth metal was lightly covered in snow. Two faint seams were visible along the surface. A manhole cover? If it is, I've never seen one like it. You jerk. What's the readout? It's just above 258 Kelvin. Down a bit from last time. Should we report this to Mr. Kerr? Meh. Still within safe ranges. Maybe spreading, but it's under control. For now. Even a small nudge in the equilibrium could cause a cascade. Dude, relax. Just a few more sights to hit before we can punch out. Let's get this over with. With all this... Hard to say with all the snow. I think of the town fine. I can almost make out letters under there. A town could this even be? Couldn't be another town less deep into the weep wood. I'm looking at evidence to the contrary. Let's figure out what we're dealing with here. Step one, snow's gotta go. See what I can do. Throw something at it. I find it best to chuck stuff. And ask questions a second. I don't have anything to chuck. Ah. stared in disbelief at a sign that now clearly read, Welcome to Beacon Pines. It doesn't make any sense. We're in Beacon Pines? How's that possible? We ran away from the town. How did we get back here? I guess we got turned around. 
Where'd all this snow come from? It's been colder than normal, isn't it? That's a pretty big difference between th what about that? <laughs> Arctic hellscape. Why did I give you a lisp? Those damn teeth. The paddle we fought at before. It was cold. Maybe all of it leads to one source, source, source. You think it's related? What the hell's going on? We're gonna get you some answers. Let's keep moving. The fencing glistened, each chain link encapsulated with a translucent layer of ice. Looks like the stuff they put up around Reap Red. The stuff who put up? I don't know. Luca, Luca, you there? Luca had almost forgotten the walkie-talkie he was carrying. That bozo car. Hope nothing bad's happened to you out in those woods. Luca looked at Iggy with hesitation. No need to be rude. With a resigned sigh, Luca responded. Seems like they're in a dangerous thing in the woods. As you. He speaks, the young man of the hour. Now, how in tarnation did you end up with one of our radios? Just lucky, I guess. Boy, how you fan horns are full of surprises, aren't you? You know my parents? I never had the honour of meeting your father, but your mum sure was a handful. Luca winced, shoving the walkie-talkie back into his pocket. Gotta keep moving. The crunching of footsteps trailing Luca went hush. He looked back to see Iggy's face twisted with confusion. Everyone's gone. What? There's nothing here but more snow. There must be an explanation for all this. We have to keep looking. You can look all you want. I quit. Iggy, we have to keep going. You don't get it, do you? This isn't one of your pathetic Hank Atomic stories. We aren't going to save the day. We aren't even going to save ourselves. My faith is mangled. The town, the thwaid, <laughs> and everyone we've ever known, gone. We don't know that. You can't just quit. Do whatever you want. I'm done. Iggy, it's gonna be okay. Luca peered upward at the darkening sky. He let out a long, foggy breath. <laughs> a fong loggy breath. Faintly, Iggy began to cry. Seeing Iggy in such a pathetic state gave Luca a sense of compassion and more than a little guilt. It is getting pretty late, I think. Probably not a great idea to stumble around in the dark anyway. Luca allowed himself to collapse next to Iggy. Let's just rest for a bit. The boys huddled together for warmth and comfort. If not for exhaustion, their minds would be racing, trying to make sense of the events of the day. As it was, all they had energy for was to sit in silence. None. everything over. It's kind of calming. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had time to say it, but thanks. Huh? Forget nothing away from those creeps. I thought I froze up back there. Little, I should be the one apologizing. This all happened because I lost my temper. Nah, that's bull hockey. 
First of all, you didn't know what that gunk would do. You didn't, right? Of course not. And second, stop with this baloney about losing your temper. But I did lose my temper. Iggy motioned sarcastically to his half-deformed face. Obviously. But that's exactly what you said it on. Huh? I was being a horse's ass. It was supposed to be a horse's ass in response. That's how it works. Iggy, I'm having a hard time following. You wanted me to fight you? Of course. Jeez. You goody goody types take forever to understand this very basic point. Why would you go around saying cruel things trying to get into fights? Iggy shrugged. Something to do? You're an asshole because you're bored? Sometimes I just feel empty. You wouldn't understand. You and Rollo are always having a blast together. Laughing, calling that dinky little treehouse mitten control. Iggy wept openly. Perfect little Luca Van Horn. With his perfect little life. My life's not perfect. Everybody in town likes you. Not everybody. Hell, that new girl hasn't even unpacked yet and she already liked you. You have Tush. He wiped his nose with a sleeve. I love Tith. Tith is great. <laughs> and now I can't even say her name because of my mangled face. But she ain't exactly the world's greatest conversationalist, you know? Luca gave a warm chuckle. I get that impression. Iggy cleared his throat as he wiped his eyes. <laughs> Must be running out here. Definitely. Iggy arched into a wide yawn. We should probably try and get some sleep. Yeah. Let's lay low. Tomorrow we get to the bottom of this. Luca's eyelids began to slowly drift shut. Luca? Yeah? I always did want to see the inside of your dinky little tree health. What do you think? Not bad. I'll give you the full tour when we get back. You know what? That's all Luca could whisper before succumbing to sleep. Are we about to the shining out here? Iggy snuggled in some more. When it comes to the worst day of my entire life, this one wasn't half bad. Aww. The house smelled of warm bread. Luca was playing with toy blocks on the living room rug. He looked up to see his parents on the couch. His mother held his father's head in her lap. She idly stroked his hair while humming a song. A voice behind Luca spoke. This is how you remember them, huh? Luca turned to see his own face. The doppelganger from his dreams, still clad in a yellow hazmat suit, still carrying a look of disdain behind empty eyes. <laughs> Look at this perfectly cozy scene. You know, it wasn't really like this. The figure picked up a toy block and inspected it. It's amazing, the facades that one can build given the right materials. Not that I blame us, there are a child's memories. They're warm and fuzzy. You don't remember, do you? Luca snatched the block from the figure's yellow gloved hand. Remember what? The doppelganger pointed to the couch. The last day we saw him alive. The day he chose to abandon us. Luca turned to look at his father, still lounging on the couch. That's not true. He didn't abandon us. The doppelganger waved his hand dismissively. 
everything is true here. It's just a matter of what we choose to see. Let me show you. The world flickered and pulsed. Luca was sitting next to his bed, listening to his heartbeat with one of his dad's stethoscopes. The doppelganger limped into the room. Not now. We both know that's not how this went. He grabbed Luca's hand and guided the stethoscope to the floor. Luca heard muffled shouting brought close by the stethoscope. It was his parents, fighting. Do you remember what we did next? Luca gave a slow nod and crept down the hall to peek through the banister. He could see the outline of his mother at the bottom of the stairs. Damn it, well, we can't afford to get involved in this. She was scared. His father stepped forward. What am I supposed to do? Just watch. There's a sickness in this town and we both know who's behind it. I swore an oath to help people. I won't turn my back on them. Luca's mother grabbed Walt. She was crying, pleading. I can't lose you. Walt calmly removed Eleanor's hand from his shoulder. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. I could never live with myself if I let Sharper get away with this. Eleanor raised her voice. Spare me your bullshit platitudes. What about our son? Luca flinched, dropping the stethoscope down the stairs. Walt turned with a panicked smile. Luca, uh, is that you, buddy? With tears in his eyes, Luca descended the stairs. Mom? Dad? Or what's going on? Walt dropped to a knee to meet Luca eye to eye. Nothing, buckaroo. Your mum and I just got a little overexcited is all. Luca placed the stethoscope against his father's chest. His heart was racing. It sounded like you were going somewhere. Walt gently removed the device from Luca's ears. Listen to me, Luca. I have some business to take care of. I'll be back in time to tuck you in. Luca hugged his father tightly. Promise? Walt stood up and walked to the door. He glanced over his shoulder. I promise. With a wink and a grin, he put on his hat and strode out into the evening sun. A figure approached soundlessly from the foggy snowfall. It stood above them, lingering in contemplation. Slowly raising one hand above Iggy, it snapped out two brisk wraps on his head. From a deep slumber, Iggy sprang up defensively. Get your hands off me! Whether it was the calming presence or the recognition that he was not in danger, Iggy felt his clenched fists lower. Just what do you think he's doing? Luca looked up, gradually remembering his whereabouts. The figure exhaled a cloud of warm vapor. You two certainly have caused a lot of commotion. What's that supposed to mean? Take it easy, Iggy. We were asleep minding our own business. You're the one running around knocking on people's heads. Sorry if I hurt you, Iggy. You didn't hurt nobody. Anybody. Huh? Oh, I see. You think you're better than me? When it came to complete strangers, Iggy had trouble cobbling together an insult. You big-hatted, scarfy-necked, furball. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's lower the temperature a little bit here. Interesting choice of words. I mean, let's all just calm down. Here we go. A friend. An observer. A hitchhiker on the infinite expense of possibility. Great. How about a name? If you must call me something, you can call me 
Nat. Iggy huffed with gratification. How about you make like a gnat and buzz off? Very well. Nat began to turn away indifferently. Oh, well, do you love her? You might say that. So you know where we are? You might also say that. Look, pal, we just want to find a way safe way out of here. Are you going to help us or not? Before knowing how to leave, one must know where they are. Alright, that does it. Luca, I don't know about you, but I'm getting out of here, one way or another. Iggy turned sharply and began to stomp off. Enough with the riddles. Iggy, right up. Realizing he'd worn their patience thin, Nat relented. Very well. I suppose this isn't the time for metaphors. I'll show you how to get back home. Uka and Iggy turned around with hope in their eyes. Come here. Nat took a deep breath in. Close your eyes. Nat exhaled slowly, then snapped his fingers. Okay, open them. For a brief moment, Uka and Iggy let themselves believe that some great magic was about to unfold. Until they opened their eyes and found themselves in the exact same place. Cold and disheartened. This is your home. This is Beacon Pines. Look, Nat, we don't know how we got here. Maybe we stumbled for some time travel gate in Reapwood. Or we teleported to some alternate universe. Or this is all some cruel experiment by Karen has goons. But this is not our home. You're inching closer to the truth. Alas, the reality is much less fanciful. Just give it to a three. So be it. As I said, this is Beacon Pines. The original true Beacon Pines. What? The upside down is where we are now? Before? You both grew up here. But the town you've called your home for the past several years is a replica. A remarkable achievement of engineering. That's crazy. But a replica nonetheless. That's impossible. It's too much work. You'd need a whole town to replicate a whole town. Indeed, to pull off such a feat would require immense labor power. That which could be moved would be moved. That which could not would require a precise duplicate. I read a no-test. Someone read a no-test. You'd think so, unless the auditing was impeccable. A mind-numbing attention to detail. As for the innumerable trivialities which complete the tapestry, you can leave that to this miraculous thing we call a brain. It has a real aversion to discontinuity, a revulsion even. The brain has a wonderful way of smoothing out the rough edges, keeping us sane. I wonder if we go back to the other place if we can notice, like, things that are off. Luca and Iggy looked around uncomfortably. Do you think that someone made an entire new town and moved us all and no one noticed? Precisely. But Ryan, why is the one question that can never be answered with certainty? The best one can do is to uncover. Nat narrowed his eyes, furrowed his brow, and uttered, The source. Why'd you say the thoughts like that? Why, indeed. Luca began to laugh uncomfortably. <laughs> Uh, so ridiculous. That's no matter. He looked down at his feet. His eyes darted back and forth in contemplation. With a sudden pain, a thought struck him. If this really is home, 
He sprinted off into the pale distance. As Iggy turned to follow, Nat called out. Iggy? It's not too late to turn back. Simple head west through Weepwood. The source. Nat expressed his sympathy with a shrug and sauntered off as unassumingly as he'd arrived. He'd given Luca and Iggy what they needed and nothing more. As Luca sprinted across the snow, the events of the past few days became clearer, pieces to a larger puzzle. Rollo said he was underground somewhere, captured. Mr. Kerr tried to cover it up with lies. The clipboards were hellbent on capturing Iggy. It all seemed to point to perennial harvest. But right now, there was one thing that Luca needed to know. The grave? Luca stopped dead in his tracks. The tree was gone, uprooted and moved, leaving a raw gash in the earth. He dropped to his knees and dug wildly at the cold snow. His numb hands hit something hard, a headstone. A dry whisper escaped Luca's lips. You're alone. For the last time, I thought I was visiting you. But you've been here. Alone. In the snow. Dad, I'm so sorry. They ruined your favorite spot in the world. Our favorite spot in the world. Dad, what do I do? There was no reply, just snow-covered silence. <laughs> Why did you give me the flip like that? What if I couldn't find you, you jerk? Iggy finally noticed the tears welling in Luca's eyes in the snow-covered grave. Iggy, there? Stole his tree again. Yikes. Suddenly they heard the crunch of approaching footsteps in the snow. <laughs> we gotta hide. Two, five, nine, okay. Fall off distance, still good. Dude, did you hear me? I said 259. Sorry. You ever think about what we did here? Saved a whole town of people. Doesn't feel like it sometimes. What about everything we left behind? That's the grave of someone with a family. The people who loved them will never know the truth. Truth's overrated. He bent down to scoop up a snowball and lobbed it playfully. Hey, don't be such a downer, dude. We took this job to change the world. Yeah? Come on. It's almost lunchtime. <laughs> Weirdo. Here I thought I was a jerk. Need to think of it, they're out here literally dancing on graves. Lucas stuttered through heaving sobs. I thought I was visiting him. I thought he was with me. Not gonna lie. That's a bad break. Hit them advice. Iggy gave Luca a solid smack on the back of his head. Help! Who's any of this helping? What? Sitting here in the snow crying like some puss over? Who are you helping? Iggy, look what they did. They lied to everyone. Blah, blah, blah. Luca Van Horn, you're a lot of things, but you made a puss over. What did I tell you before? When some jerk comes that you're acting like a horse's ass? I should stand up for myself. Hell yeah. Kerr and his merry little band of clipboards to pull off their switcheroo for a reason, right? Nat mentioned something about a source. Luca wiped his eyes with a sleeve. Whatever's at the source must be awfully valuable to perennial harvest. So it would be a shame if something unfortunate would happen to their precious source, wouldn't it? 
Which have in mind. If it's small enough to steal, we snatch it. If it's too big to snatch, we smash it. <laughs> Just giving him all the S's as well. Or if it's too big to smash. Iggy flashed a mischievous smile and cracked his knuckles. I'm always up for a challenge. I'm gonna make this right, Dad. I promise. Let's do this. Source, here we come. It can get awful cold out there in those woods, though, huh? Probably best you two stay put and conserve your energy. Helps on the way. Where's Rollo? Where's my mum? Did you kill her? Oh, heavens no. Do I seem like a killer to you? Iggy and Luca shared a skeptical look. Well, do I? Oh, shucks now. That hurts my feelings. Screw that guy. Wait a minute. If this is the original town, then that means... Iggy darted behind a large pine and began digging furiously. He emerged holding a shoebox with a crude skull painted on its lid. What's that? Long story. A few years back, I, uh... came into possession of some premium-grade fireworks. Not the wimpy firecracker stuff they give kids. The good stuff. Why'd you bury it under a tree? That's the long part of the story. You and Rollo were doing chores at Rollo's chicken coop. <gasps> you guys pissed me off for some reason or another. Luca rolled his eyes with realization. No, you didn't. Iggy stifled a chuckle. Flaming chicken coop, it was Iggy. Yep. I just wanted to give you guys a little scare. But like I said, these were some primo fireworks. So I might have underestimated things. You blew up the chicken coop? I prefer to think of it as an incendiary way to recreate them. Sorry, but you sort of seen the looks on your faces. I'm so sick of this place, I'm sorry. Rollo got grounded for months. Which is why I needed to theft the evidence and lay low. So I buried them under that tree. But when I came back from later, they were gone. I figured some grown-up had them and tossed them. Iggy triumphantly raised the shoebox. Turns out, wasn't the fireworks that got moved. With us. Unbelievable. Do you think this is a game? Newsflash, boyo. You're not a hero. You're a little brat who is in way over his head. A hero is just someone who refuses to give up. Comics these days are rotting children's brains. Everyone thinks they're a spaceman superhero. I was always partial to Hank Atomic myself. Is that so? Do you really think you have a chance against us? You have no idea how powerful we are. Prepare for blast off, loser. Luca and Iggy inched up to the edge of the hole with bewilderment in their eyes. Arctic air breathed out the cavern in heaving gusts. Echo, 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 echo. Wow. I can see why they wanted to move us around a town now. Why would they dig a giant hole? I think this is it. There through the fourth? It's a dang hole? How do we smash a hole? Oh, it's much more than that. My annoying little friend. Okay. Where's Rollo? I wasn't lying before. He's safe. 
Well, safer than you two, at least. Drats, it's cold. You just had to drag me all the way out here, didn't you? Mr. Kerr gazed down the abyss in contemplation. Really is something, isn't it? What did you do to our town? What is all of this? Well, that's a doozy of a question. This is the source where they collect the unrefined... Uh... Kerr scratched the back of his head. Honestly, boys, I don't understand any of this well enough to explain it. Fact of the matter is, I'm not paid to know. What do you mean you don't know? Ain't you in charge? <laughs> Heavens no. My role is merely to flash a winning smile and manage various complications. Complications like us? You are a smart boy. His face contorted into a saccharine grin. It really is nothing personal. Some people are destined to strive for greatness. And others are simply obstacles along the way. It seemed like you were destined to be a creepy lackey. The point is, we all play our part in life. Mine just happens to be a lead in the role of a lifetime. And you happen to be extras. Ready for your curtain call. You aren't giving up without a fight. Your smile's not going to be so winning after we're done with you. Now, boys, there's no need for melodrama. It makes even a professional such as myself embarrassed for you. Let's change the mood a bit. Kerr snapped his fingers. Scene change. <laughs> there. That's better. Deal with them. Iggy turned to Luca with a sly glance. Why are you smirking? Because I have a box full of fireworks. And you don't. Iggy waved the box into the air, threatening to drop it down the hole. Stop. Let's not do something regrettable. Joke's on you. Regret's one of my special teeth. Out of curiosity, what would happen if I threw these in your precious hole? Nothing. Nothing at all. You're a terrible liar. I'll have you know, I'm an exceptional liar. Bup, 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 bup. That's far enough. Iggy plucked a single bottle rocket from the box and held it up with reverence. Stop, you fool. Call off your goons. After a long pause, Mr. Kerr flung up his hand with frustration. Very well. You all can head back for the night. It's been a long day. I'll handle these two from here. Mr. Kerr sighed into the frigid air. It's just us now, Wiggy. You can put that down. What? Like this? With a nonchalant flick, Iggy tossed the firework into the hole. Ooh. Wow. Look at his face. With a growl, Kerr leapt at Iggy, crashing through Luca. Iggy tried to twist away, but in the struggle, they both tumbled over the side. Luca dove forward, bracing Iggy's hand just before it slipped. His grip was made precarious by the cold, wet snow. He could see Kerr further down, clinging to Iggy's coat. You reckless child. What have you done? 
Luca, listen to me. Hold on tight and use the walkie-talkie to call them back. How? How? Well, what channel do I use? It doesn't make a damn difference. They're always listening. If you do that, the clipboard will just hold it up and thank us both. The only way you get out of this is if Kurt out of the picture. Just let go. Save yourself. If he lets go, we both die. I don't want to die. But seeing the look on your faith almost makes it worth it. Mr. Kerr, you've had a long life. Why don't you actually do something selfless and just let go? Mr. Kerr gasped with insult. Long life. I'll have you know I can still play 25. You should have heard me sing the part of Phileas Young. With a wild look in his eye, Mr. Kerr began to hum the proud melody. Wow. Can you believe this guy? Hum. Luca's hand began to cramp. His voice began to crack. Kerr, just let go. No can do. If you want to save your friend, you'll have to save me too. Luca. Look at me. It's okay. Luca felt Iggy loosen his grip. You aren't going to kill your friend like that, are you? Every muscle in Luca's body burned. Not his friend. Yes. Gerard. No good bully. Like you, Kerr. Little no. Luca felt his hand slipping. And I told you what you need to do with bullies. I can't. It's your only way out of this mess. Two birds, one stone. Make sense for us to fall together. Wackadoos travel in packs. A calm settled over Iggy's face. Luca, let me do this. Iggy's voice was colder than the bitter air billowing from the chasm. Let me do the right thing. no choice. Oh my gosh. But to accept Iggy's request. So emotional. Literally tearing up. With a quiet blink, Luca watched a teardrop sail down into the howling void. As his fingers slowly gave up, he met eyes with Iggy. Good. The two silhouettes were swallowed by darkness. Sad. Hell of a goodbye, Iggy. Luca, you should really step back. What? Quickly. Whoa, how come it did that this time? Curious. Fireworks of Iggy's must have been just the right amount of energy. 
should get out of here before perennial harvest arrives. Not until you'll tell me what just happened. Your friend's sacrifice just saved this town. For a little while, anyway. How? Tempus liquamine is a peculiar substance. It can change the relationship between matter and time itself. What if I lose the ability to go back now? What if because the source is gone I can't change anything? Doing so requires unfathomable energy. In a closed system, that energy can only come from its surroundings. A useful side product of this property being... By adding precisely the correct amount of energy to it, one can create a cryogenic cascade. So this gunk makes things cold and fireworks make the whole frizz over? It's one way of putting it, yes. As dumb luck would have it, the fireworks weren't strong enough to generate a runaway reaction. I shudder to think what would have happened in that case. We have some idea of what that would look like. It'll take them a good while to safely break through and access the source again. If you know this stuff, why haven't you been helping? I have been. In my way. Each one of us has our role to play. Iggy's role, it turns out, was to buy us precious time. Mine has been to observe. And wait. God, I'm getting such big lost vibes from this game. The TV show. Wait for what? You. Me? Why? What's my role? A fierce twinkle flashed in Nat's eyes. Luca Van Horn. You were going to save the world. With a chuckle, Nat turned and walked west. Dumbfounded, Luca followed behind him, trudging through the snow. I swear, if this ends here on a cliffhanger, every step taking him further away from everyone and everything he knew, and closer to destiny. To be continued? Be combines too? Be complains to Pines Hot? No way. You are joking me. Revenge served cold. Second time's a charm. Wait. That's it? This ends with a crummy cliffhanger just when it was getting good? I was even starting to like Yiki. No way. I refuse to be associated with some never-ending parade of sequels. Let's go back and find something more definitive. Oh my god, I thought that was like canon ending. I mean, it could be, right? Maybe that is kind of a canon ending for a sequel, but we'll find something else in the meantime. Good lord. Which means only one thing. Going to fire and ice and humming. He began to hum. After the death of his father, Luca had trouble sleeping. Each night, his mother would sit at the foot of his bed and hum a gentle melody. This game's made me cry too much. God, it's just very emotional, isn't it? Or I'm just very emotional. I'm a broken person, it's fine. It was the only thing that could calm his mind. The only thing that, however briefly, could make it all seem okay. That melody pervaded every memory Luca had of his mother. Shivering in the raw snow, he began to hum. Gorgeous. 
Gran lowered the torch, listening closely. As recognition slowly set in, her heart sank. Those countless nights of consolation, the incomparable loss they shared together. She let the torch fall to the snow and sizzle out. A few steps toward Luca was all she could bear before dropping to the snow herself. Through a flood of tears, she began to hum along, note for note. This mirror is this crazy beautiful and moving. It hits. Luca lifted his head in astonishment. The last time he heard that melody was the last night he saw his mother. How do you know? So sorry, my little buckaroo. Buckaroo? The only people who call me that are my dad. Your mother. Luca blinked through blurry, watery eyes, trying to see more clearly. Just make out the impression of a familiar face. He peered across the snowscape at the woman on her knees. Something about her was undeniably his mother. Only smaller, older, changed. Mom? It's right, Buckaroo. Mom? Luca sprinted as fast as he could toward his mother. They held each other close, and the cold retreated from their bodies. <laughs> oh god, it's so hard to do voices when you're upset. <clears throat> Eleanor, I thought you were... Gone? You should have known I would never abandon my son. Eleanor looked down at Luca, tightening her embrace in an appeal for forgiveness. Hail. You're a smart man, Joseph. Thought you'd have pieced it together by now. You were exposed. Mom, I don't understand any of this. What happened? Where did you go? Where did you leave, Mel? I never left you. I was always right here, Luca. Why did you lie to me? You tore me up, Luca. But I did it to keep you safe. I thought that getting answers would help us both move on. But the more I discovered, the more I realized we, the danger we were in. Until the perennial harvest was stopped, it was better if everyone thought I was gone. Luca had a trusted man. These are bad people, Luca. They won't stop until they get what they want. And they don't care who gets hurt in the process. <clears throat> what do we do? We'll have to stop them. Joseph slumped into the cold, wet snow. They can't be stopped. This is too big. I can't do his voice when I'm nearly crying, okay? God, I thought he was a black. 
bloody side character that would have just appeared like literally once or twice, gave him a stupid deep southern voice, but ridiculous. I tried beating them at their own game. I'm done fighting fire with fire. For the first time in a long time, her voice felt like her own again. No more lies. I see now there's a better way to stop perennial harvest. The cold, hard truth. Luca gazed down at Nuncreed with pity. He looked small. Joseph stared into the snow as if searching it for answers. Come on, everyone. We've got a party to crash. <sighs> what an emotional two scenes it's been by this source, ma'am. Wow. <laughs> you don't understand. He always wins. Shut up, Nuncreed, and get out of here with your voice. The devil you know. Seven months ago, Eleanor Van Horn crept down the maze of sterile hallways under perennial harvest. She stopped in front of the large steel door marked Deep Engineering. No turning back now. She raised a trembling hand. The stolen keycard worked as promised, and the door buzzed open with a mechanical efficiency. She was immediately hit with the smell of disinfectant. It was some sort of laboratory. In one corner was a desk covered in papers. Across the room stood a tall metal pod with hoses protruding from its base. She rushed to the desk and began shifting through piles of papers. They were experiment reports on something called Tempusiliquamine. There were dozens of them. Every one stamped failed. Eleanor heard the sharp echo of footsteps approaching. She was out of time. Her eyes scanned the room, eventually landing on the strange pod. Muttering a curse under her breath, she dashed over and dove inside. That's how she ended up back in time, I guess, and has, like, been aging or something? Or in the other place? Or, is she, like, she's been away, right? Or is she just, like, pretending to be an old woman? Like, she is older, so she must have, like, gone somewhere. And that is what change is all about. Grabbing the future by the scrub of the neck and making things happen. Change is a choice. I'm tickled pink, we'll all be making that choice together. This man is a liar. Excuse me. I will not. This town has a dangerous secret, and perennial harvest only exists to keep it hidden. Nonsense. They picked up the whole damn town and moved it right under our noses. You aren't making any sense, dear. Mr. Kerr addressed the crowd with a sarcastic tone. Imagine such a thing. It's absurd and just plain impossible. They promised they could fix the foul harvest. They told us they would clean this place up. We just had to leave town for a few days. But while they had us evacuated... Mrs. Hartford, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to... You're afraid of a lot of things, aren't you? You sniveling little worm. <laughs> this is growing tiresome, my... A little help, please. Don't you all see? This festival is a sham. An excuse to have the whole town gather in one place. They're planning something awful. I don't know what, but these people are wicked. <laughs> don't listen to her. She has absolutely no proof. I am the proof. I'm Eleanor Van Horn. Whispers filtered through the crowd. <laughs> well, aren't you just sneaky as the dickens? We all knew Valentine's fertilizer was too good to be true. And now this whole town's paying the price. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry about this disruption. My associates will take this obviously disturbed woman somewhere comfortable. So she can get the help she needs. Non Creed. <laughs> She's not the one who's disturbed. You too determined clown. 
y'all know there's something wrong with this town. It was just easier to look the other way. The truth is... The boss. I knew it. It's quite enough, Mr. Nuncreed. Torment dragged on Joseph Nuncreed's face. Wow. Yes, so. Take them away. No. I want them to see this. Ah, the ever tempestuous Eleanor Van Horn. You've been quite the thorn in my side. Like a weed that's burrowed in where it doesn't belong. I must confess, you look dreadful. He paused for a moment, plucking a piece of fuzz from his sweater and discarding it to the ground. Consider yourself in rare company. You've managed to pull one over on me. It won't happen again. I knew you had some sort of plan to disrupt our little party. But alas, I expected something a bit more impressive than incoherent rambling. No matter. Your failures are yours to bear. Mr. Carr? Yes, sir? It's a shame it was cut short, but I thank you for that rousing oratory. I'll take it from here. Yes, sir. Of course. You've done quality work for me, William. You can look forward to the recompense we agreed upon. Kerr gave a bow of deference. deference. Founder, you are most gracious. Gasps rippled through the crowd. Thankfully, we can dispense with the formalities from here on out. Solomon pulled a glass vial from his pocket. In one smooth motion, he downed its contents. A triumphant smile grew across Solomon's lips. You can all call me... Sharper. Valentine. His body and face began to contort and expand as he disappeared into a belching green mist. He's aging. A hushed horror gripped the crowd, and that's what happened to Mum. This is a story about change. No. <laughs> so you didn't see that coming. Good. Sharper examined his new hands. Well, this is quite the improvement. Everything looks so much smaller now. Eleanor was right about one thing. This festival was a ruse. I wanted you all to witness my glorious return with your own eyes. Why does everyone look so downtrodden? This is a celebration, people. Maybe it would help if we set the mood. Mr. Carr, be a dear and reveal the sign. <laughs> Wonderful. Sharper choked out a crude squawk of a laugh. Frustrated grumbles sprinkled through the crowd. Sharper, you malicious bastard. Malice. Best picture. Grinch. Christmas. Glad you're back so I can tell you to your face. You destroyed this town. We ain't gonna let you get away with it again. <laughs> Sorry. It's not the time for audience participation. Some assistance, Mr. Kerr. William Kerr gave a subtle nod to the clipboards. You coward. Does anyone else have something to contribute? A helpless quiet settled over the crowd. Thought so. Did you all truly believe you could be free of me? A town 
of complete and utter fools. You people should be celebrating my return. You're clearly lost without me. And that leads me nicely to my children. Daddy? I gave you both the greatest gift a parent can give. The opportunity to prove yourselves in my absence. Squandered. To say I'm disappointed would be an understatement. But I... Silence, Augustus. An adult is speaking. I don't know which is worse, a son who is completely hopeless, or a daughter with such potential who inevitably lets me down. Eres, you fail me with admirable consistency. Thankfully, I was counting on it this time. Father, I... Have been wasting time, my dear. What have you accomplished? I was focused on cementing our legacy. Legacy? Who needs a legacy when you can just live forever? But what about... It's all right, kiddo. I'm afraid you suffer from a complete lack of imagination. Just no helping it. Now then, where is Joseph? You didn't take the opportunity to slip off, did you? Ah, there he is. Everyone should give him a hand. None of this would have been possible without Joseph. I think you've said enough. Nonsense. The people deserve to know how helpful and loyal you've been. I only did what I did because he left me no choice. You always had a choice, Joseph. You were simply too weak to take it. No matter, cheer up. You're about to be rich beyond your wildest dreams. You should follow Mr. Kerr's example. When I found him, he was in a sorrier state than any of you. An aging actor, desperate to recapture his youth. He played his part, and soon he'll be able to play the leading man again. Forever, in fact, if he remains loyal. That goes for all of you. Well, those who haven't already frittered away my goodwill. Beacon Pines is mine, again. And I am willing to share its spoils in exchange for absolute loyalty. Are you saying William Kerr was never in charge of perennial forest harvest? <laughs> you think that puffed-up blatherskite could have accomplished all of this? Dawn, I suppose it's time for your big exclusive. Sharper addressed the crowd with indignant pride. He'd planned this moment for so long that now, at the deed's fruition, it almost felt frivolous. You see, I needed a figurehead to hold things down while I orchestrated my return. Someone to misdirect lie and bilk this town for a spell. So I invented William Kerr. Take your bow, you've earned it. Mr. Kerr flourished a preposterously elaborate bow. Patrick C. Montesquieu, thespian extraordinaire, at your service. Isn't that the one that wrote the book about acting that's in the library? That's so funny. Founder, I just want to say thank you again for this opportunity. It truly was the role of a lifetime. Wait. This Bill Kerr was a patsy the whole time. A patsy. Bill Kerr. Patsy. Well, your secret's out in the open. What's to stop this town from rising up against you? <laughs> That's the delicious part. Fear. Thanks to our clipboards, I know what each and every person in this town fears the most. And I will make those fears manifest for anyone who steps out of line. The choice is simple. I am not afraid of you. <laughs> The young hero. I've kept a keen eye on you, boy. You and your friends made a habit of disrupting my plans. What a pity. If things have gone a bit differently, you might have had your moment of triumph. But that's fate for you. You can't do this. Oh, but I can. I have won. Never underestimate what a great man can do, given time. 
And now time is my plaything. Perhaps the most expensive thing I've ever bought. But well worth it. <laughs> Sharper coughed up one final laugh and cracked his knuckles. Enough chit-chat. Let's get to work, shall we? And so Sharper set about remaking the town in his own image. The fertilizer factory soon reopened for business. Sales rose steadily as more and more farmers across the countryside began to swear by its miraculous properties. Beacon Pines became famous. A secretive town that for the right price shared its gifts with all. Gifts that became more and more necessary in a world where winters grew longer and longer. The end? This is wrong, but things are becoming clearer now. You can feel it, right? We can't let Sharper win. He might just be the key to this whole thing. Let's see. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. The next part is the final part. It is time for the big finale. I will see you in the next one. Until then, have a wonderful day and click one of these videos on the screen or check out one of my playlists if you want to go on some more adventures. I'll see you next time.